Thank All you. right, here we go. Okay, uh, well, we have a lot to cover, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Thursday. Um, hope everybody had a good, good night last night and are, are ready to have some fun today. Um, today we're going to talk about what's been traditionally a little bit of a controversial topic in OpenStack, which is skipping releases on upgrades. Um, so my name is Mark Velker. I'm the OpenStack architect at VMware. Uh, my name is Karol Stanievski. I'm a senior staff, a member of technical staff in VMware. Hi, my name is Siddharth Sorano. I'm a staff engineer in VMware, engineering for VIO. Um, so I want to set the stage a little bit um, for talking about uh, skipping releases. Um, and to do that, we have to think back a little ways. Um, so let's think back to about 2011, um, which is about when I started working at OpenStack. Um, uh, the Diablo Design Summit, I think, was my first, first one, and Cactus was my, my first release in the lab. Um, in that day and age, in 2011, there were not very good incentives to skip releases. In fact, pretty much the opposite, right? Um, in those early days, each subsequent release of OpenStack was a big change. Uh, and it was delivering a lot of stuff that everybody needed. The core functionality of OpenStack was really still being developed in those early days. Um, so there really wasn't a lot of incentive to skip uh, releases. Um, no matter which timelines uh, were for traditional apps, um, it kind of made a lot more sense to, uh, to bring in those new releases as fast as you can. Um, fast forward five years, a lot of that core functionality is now very well established. Um, when we talk to customers out in the field, a lot of times, um, you know, they're saying, yeah, you know, that thing that they added would be a nice thing to have, but um, really the things that I've got to have to keep my cloud up, up and running, they're there. Um, so, you know, we can sort of bundle a lot of those new features that I want, but don't necessarily need immediately uh, into, into one, one larger upgrade, and maybe that's a better, better path for me. Um, and in those early days especially, uh, upgrades were really, really hard. Um, I remember trying to go from Cactus to Diablo in my lab, and man, what a disaster. It was basically build a new cloud um, and start all over from scratch. Um, you know, disrupt all my workloads and bring them up on somewhere else, and uh, man, what a mess. Um, so to its credit, the OpenStack community recognized what a big issue that was, and they made a lot of, a lot of improvements over time in being able to upgrade uh, from release to release. Now, the focus has traditionally been upstream on N and N minus 1, right? Um, but it turns out there's, there's actually a lot of the infrastructure that we need there uh, to go a little bit wider than that, if that's what suits your organization. Um, there's a lot of backward compatibility in some projects. We now have DB migrations for almost everything. Uh, there's versioned objects uh, and a lot more sort of um, real world upgrade experience. People have, uh, operators have gotten together and talked and, and kind of figured out strategies for coping with, with things like upgrades that are, that are fairly big changes. Um, so this is not 2011 anymore, right? Uh, this is 2016, almost 2017, um, and we've come quite a long way. Um, still, though, if you're running an OpenStack cloud in production today, chances are actually pretty good you're not running the most recent release. Um, if you look at the, uh, uh, the new uh, user survey that came out, um, look at the numbers for who's running Juno, Kilo, or Liberty. They're all higher than Mataka. Um, and I guarantee you they're higher than Newton, <laughs> since that's uh, really fresh off the presses. So there's definitely some lag in, in what people are actually running, right? Uh, so we can kind of see that um, deployers themselves aren't really necessarily closely following the upstream release dates. Um, and then we ask, well, are they actually following the six-month um, release cadence as well? Um, we've talked to operators in the field. It turns out a lot of Mart, right? There's still a lot of clouds that are running fairly, fairly old versions, maybe a year or two back, um, that you know, sort of have that core functionality that they need, um, and they sort of want to de-risk their uh, operations by not introducing upgrades too often. Um, and we also have now seen that OpenStack now fits this huge diversity of organizations, um, industries, use cases. Um, you know, if you if you listen to Jonathan Bryce talk on stage, he'll talk about automotive, he'll talk about NFV, he'll talk about e-commerce, he'll talk about CI/CD, a um, whole wide variety of different use cases. So OpenStack is a really flexible, powerful thing that can fit in all those different use cases, right? And it turns out um, that not everybody wants to stay close on master because that's not what fits their particular industry or their particular use case, right? And it turns out that when we're looking at upgrades, there's a lot of different patterns that we can now fit in as well for all those different needs too. Um, so it's a big credit to the inside community that we developed something that flexible. So when we think about doing skip release upgrades, um, one of the things you need to ask is, what's your organization actually like? What does your battle card for your organization look like? Do you need to qualify hardware and software upgrades? Do you have this rigorous like six month process that your IT has to go through in order just to introduce new things in your data center? Uh, or are you pretty loose and fluid and can move fast? Um, is the current version that you have working really well for you? Do you have a compelling reason to go from A to B, right? Uh, or is it something where you know, maybe there's nice to haves or um, maybe it's sort of a middle priority and maybe you have some other things you need to get done first. So it's okay if we wait a little longer on this, right? Um, 
do your upgrades coincide with hardware refreshes, maybe maintenance freezes, maybe shopping seasons? Um, I know we've got some e-commerce customers who are like, you know, when it comes to be Black Friday, nothing's changed in our data center for about a month or two before that, right? So uh, it doesn't matter when the open stack release code comes because back to school or, or Black Friday, those are the same time every year and we're not touching anything then. Um, maybe it's also things like audits or physical year calendars, right? Uh, maybe you don't want to um, disrupt things right toward the end of the physical year and the budget's ex expended and um, you, know, you don't want to risk bringing in people and paying overtime and introducing new things in your data center toward the end of the physical year, right? So there's lots of different reasons, lots of different cadences uh, that people might have for, for changing the timelines of when they deploy things. Um, also ask if you're aggressive feature adopters or you're just primarily using that core functionality, right? Is there new stuff that you want to introduce in your cloud that's critical for your, for your next set of workloads? Uh, or are you pretty well established and there's, there's sort of some nice to haves that you want to introduce? Um, and then finally, um, look at uh, the products that you're actually using. So there's a lot of different ways to consume OpenStack. There's public clouds, there's managed private clouds, there's distributions, uh, all those things. Um, and in your case, you may want to stay close because you really want to stay close to the upstream security releases, right? Uh, OpenStack provides security releases for a couple of releases back, uh, and you may not want to go outside of that window because maybe you're not working with a vendor, maybe you're rolling it your own, uh, and so you're a little bit more dependent on the upstream for the security fixes. Or maybe you're working with a vendor who um, has, has promised you that they're going to backport all those uh, security issues to even those older releases. So you're a little bit more comfortable with a more flexible timeline, right? Um, so these are, these are kind of some questions that you want to ask when you think about um, what's our upgrade strategy actually going to look like. <clears throat> um, so, you know, all that to say, uh, today's OpenStack is, is evolved quite a bit from where it used to be, right? Uh, more models of consumption, uh, more stuff out there that we can use, uh, more industries, more verticals that we're talking to, uh, more use cases that it's fitting into. Um, and the upgrade strategies are now a lot more diverse than they used to be as well. Um, and with that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why you might not want to skip releases. Um, again, if you're working with a very small team and you're very dependent on outside services, um, maybe skipping releases isn't necessarily for you because you really are dependent on upstream for those bug fixes, right? You're not going to get those unless somebody upstream uh, pushes them to you. Or maybe you need those new features, uh, or maybe you're very dependent on individual project APIs. Turns out over time, OpenStack changes its API. All right, and we do that in a, a fairly friendly way, right? We have micro versions now. Uh, we're pretty good about uh, saying what's the current version of an API when a major API changes. In most cases, uh, you can run more than one version of an API. Um, so I know like in our, our clouds right now, we're running Cinder v2 and v3 um, and uh, Keystone v2 and v3. Um, not always the case though. Uh, turns out there's some database stuff under the hood that makes it harder and possible to run LBAS v1 and v2 at the same time, right? Um, so maybe if you're really dependent on, on some of those um, uh, APIs, you need to stick with that older release for a little while longer until you can get your applications ready for the new, new change. Uh, and maybe you just like living on the bleeding edge, right? Um, there are people that do this. They uh, have very well-established uh, CI-CD pipelines, uh, and the concept of bringing in small incremental changes works better for them than uh, doing uh, upgrades that are, that are fairly large. Okay, so skipping releases. Now possibly a thing, right? Uh, we have OpenStack in enterprises. We have OpenStack in, in big public clouds, small public clouds, lots of different use cases uh, that move at di different cadences. So we know that there's some demand out there for people to maybe not upgrade every six months. So how do we actually get it done? Uh, oops. Um, to answer that, we got to think a little bit about what an upgrade actually entails uh, when we upgrade an OpenStack cloud. So we got to deploy the new Python bits, obviously, right? And there's a lot of underpinning libraries as well. Uh, we got to do DB schema migrations because uh, the database is one of those things that changes <coughs> in between releases. We got to deal with the potential removal of old APIs and introduction of new ones. Um, like we say, there's different versions of, of APIs for different projects. Uh, and the p potential addition of new components due to uh, things like project refactoring, right? Um, so uh, the slumber of, of two years ago doesn't look very much like the slumber of today because we've kind of decomposed some of the functionality into things like Noki and Aid and Panko, right? Um, go back to 2011, Cinder didn't exist, right? It was all Nova and Nova volume. Um, so a whole new, new service was carved out of that. Um, Neutron didn't exist in 2011. So over time, there, there are things that you're going to want to introduce into your, into your cloud. Um, you may also want to look at potential upgrades of some of the underpinning stuff, uh, whether that's your, um, you know, your MySQL database or your RabbitMQs, uh, maybe the hypervisor software that you're running, network, server, hardware, uh, storage, all those things may be things that you want to think about during upgrade cycles as well. Um, and you may want to make changes to your deployment architecture as well. Um, so maybe we start out with you know, 15 VMs in my control plane and we want to carve that down to eight. 
because uh, we find out we don't need all that, that extra capacity or we want to free up some IP addresses. Uh, or maybe we want to add some more stuff, uh, maybe separate out, um, I don't know, the Nova database from the other databases and put that on a separate uh, database cluster, right? Uh, so you got to think about architecture changes over time as well. Um, and you got to th think about testing it all and then how to turn it all on for your end users, right? So a lot of moving parts. So what we're going to demo here in a little while is how we've chosen to do this when we skip uh, releases during upgrades, and that's with the blue-green upgrade pattern. Um, so for those aren't, aren't familiar, um, very, very quickly and very simply uh, what it is, uh, you start out with a control plane. It's behind a load balancer, right? So uh, in our case, we actually load balance both the incoming APIs from end users of your cloud as well as the internal APIs, so things like Nova talking to Neutron to plumb this into your networks, right, uh, and, get, and get VMs connected up. Um, so we, we've kind of got this layer of indirection uh, that we can uh, take advantage of. What we'll actually do is we'll build a second control plane. Um, and that's kind of cool because basically when we do this, this is just a vanilla deploy. We're not actually you know, switching bits and having to worry about, oh, what happens if a package upgrade fails? It's just a deploy, just as if we were building a new thing. The downside is it takes a little bit extra resources. Um, in our case, that, like I said, it's about seven or eight VMs. Um, so it's honestly not very much for somebody who's running a cloud, right? It's a pretty small amount of capacity. Um, honestly, we have more people that have trouble with um, just making sure they remember to free up IP addresses um, than anything else, right? I don't think we would have anybody that really balked at, at storage concerns or CPU or RAM or anything like that. Um, the other cool thing is uh, when we bring up that new control plane, uh, it's a fully functional control plane. It's just not actually accepting any real world traffic right now, right? So that means as an operator, I can go into that new control plane and actually test it out. I can actually go do some functional testing and make sure it's all working together. Um, so I don't really have to worry about, you know, Novo. Uh, Nova version uh, Kilo talking to an Ice House Nova compute uh, or talking to a, uh, a Mitaka based sender, right? Um, but I actually have deployed all that together as a new deploy and I can then go in and actually functionally test the thing and make sure it's actually running. So at some point I can then plumb that into my load balancer. Um, now I can actually start accepting API traffic. Maybe I want to uh, roll that in carefully and, and uh, do some more testing with, with inbound connections. Um, and when I'm ready, now I can actually start syncing data between the two. So this is the only point in our case where we incur any control plane downtime. And keep in mind, there's no workload downtime. All the stuff that's running in your cloud, all your client applications, all those workloads, they're still running without interruption. This is the only point at which we take any downtime at all uh, in the, in the um, uh, management plane side of things. So at this point, basically, we freeze the incoming APIs uh, so that we're not making changes while we're moving data from point A to point B and running those, those schema migrations, right? Um, there's actually room for optimization there where we can make that really tiny, but as it is, this is a very, very small window. Uh, we've not actually had anybody had any real, real problems with this. Again, it's just the management side, it's not the, the data plane side. Um, the other cool thing about this is um, if we did find problems uh, when we brought up that new green control plane, we can stop the whole thing and we haven't interrupted anybody, right? This is the only point at which we have the potential for loss if something goes wrong. Um, and this is very, very simple. All we're doing is moving data and run those schema migrations. So it's a pretty simple set of stuff. It's not like we're um, you know, in the wild, on the, on the run, uh, installing new software and having things that get in a very broken state. Uh, we've minimized the set of operations where there's a window for, for harm to be done. So once that's all operational and the data is synced, uh, we basically take the uh, uh, blue control plane out from the load balancer. Now we're sending all those incoming a API requests to the new control plane, and we're up and running. And the nice thing about this is, even at this point, if we miss something during our testing, and there's something wrong with that new control plane, or maybe a storage array goes south, or, or who knows, uh, what else could happen, right? That old control plane is still there. Now, we could flip that load balancer right back around and switch right back to it immediately. We'd lose some of the data that happened in between after we did that data sync, but that's a pretty small price, price to pay if something's majorly wrong that we missed on that new side, right? So here again, we're, this is really about minimizing the risk. Um, and once all that's done, and we're happy with the new control plane, uh, we can drop the old one, reclaim those resources, put those CPUs back into the pool, all that storage, uh, all, that, all that good stuff. So it makes for a, a pretty simple uh, way to do this. Um, and if we don't want to depend on upstream having, say, N minus two compatibility, if we want to go from, from Kilo to Mitaka, um, that's actually super important. Because again, we're deploying a Mitaka control plane and not worrying about whether Mitaka can interoperate with Kilo. The only point at which we got to worry about uh, the two having some common ground is when we run those database schema migrations. And basically, we just take the set of uh, the two schema migrations between those two releases and run them together. So it makes for a pretty simple way to do a skip release upgrade. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Carl and let you uh, show him how it's done. All right. So um, I'll show you a quick demo of how we uh, do the upgrade. Let me close that. 
and go here and let's start that. So what we're gonna what we're gonna show you now is uh, a demo of uh, upgrading. Uh, that we'll go back a bit and we'll start with Icehouse and then we'll um, upgrade it to Kilo and then we'll upgrade it to Mitaka. The first part will be upgrading Icehouse to Kilo um, from VAO 1.0 to VAO 2.0. So what you can see on the screen is a browser with our um, uh, VIO plugin in vSphere um, web client. You can see version 1.0.0 and OpenStack version 2014. Dot one, dot three, which is Icehouse. You can also see a horizon where we have one instance uh, that will be there for the entire process of the upgrade. Uh, it's, it has this uh, IP that we'll connect to um, in, in top left um, terminal. Uh, and it will use a poor man's uh, way to track that it's available. So we'll just run uptime command and watch. And we'll see that it's constantly there and we are not losing traffic. In bottom left corner, you can see another terminal. Uh, we are connected to OMS, which is OpenStack Management Server. That's our uh, control center for VAO. We have two files preloaded. Those are Debian packages that uh, contain bits for upgrading um, VAO to consecutive versions to 1, to 2.0 and to 3.0. So the first command we run here is VAO patch add. That command adds our um, Debian file to our repository. Um, where we will fern, then uh, use VAO patch command, uh, VAO patch install command, to to install this Debian package. This uh, this uh, this process updates our internal internal repository with the uh, Kilo version of OpenStack. It also updates our uh, all our um, control commands like like VAO CLI commands and other things that are VAO specific. All right, so we've uh, done that. We've installed VAO um, uh, upgrade uh, Debian file. Now what we have to do, we have to log out from uh, vSphere client and we have to log in again so that our plugin is um, also updated. So that's what we're going to do now. We are logging back. Um, that's uh, what we want to get. What I'm going to see here is that VAO has been updated to 2.0. We'll go to our plugin again. And we'll see that the version has changed. And now we can see that the version of VAO, let's just make this a little bit bigger. So version is 2.0.0, that's VAO 2.0.0. And OpenStack is 2015.1.1, uh, which is Kilo. But that's, we still have our cluster uh, left to update. That's only our management server that has been updated. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to Upgrade tab, and uh, we're going to go through this wizard. This page, um, this wizard will guide us through the upgrade process. We specify deployment name for the green control plane that Mark mentioned. We specify public virtual IP and private virtual IP for this green plane, uh, that the plane with newer bits, with kilobits. Um, and th those IPs, are the, the public virtual IP is a temporary IP that we're going to use, uh, that we will be able to use to verify the new deployment. Um, that's pretty much it. That's all we, the data we have to specify. We click Finish. And here you see three timers. Um, upgrade time is the total time of the upgrade. Uh, control plane downtime is basically downtime of the OpenStack uh, cluster. And data plane downtime is the downtime of our instances, uh, the, the actual workloads we run on top of OpenStack. As you can see, uh, upgrade timer is going uh, right now, but others are not, which means we have no downtime, downtime at this moment. Uh, there you go, the first step finished. Uh, we still have our horizon available. Uh, nothing has changed, everything is available. Users can use their, their um, cloud. The only thing that changed is that we provisioned new control plane, meaning we provisioned VMs and we did a pre-configuration. So the next step is the migrate data step. That's the step that actually incurs downtime, uh, as Mark said. That's the step where we migrate the database from uh, blue control plane, in this case, Icehouse. Uh, to, um, to Kilo. So the control plane downtime started. That's uh, when uh, users cannot use their cloud for the moment, but the, all their workloads are running. As you can see in the top right corner, the, the uptime command is still there. We didn't lose the connection. The time is going up. Um, so we are migrating our data. Um, this lab is actually pretty slow, but we, could, we saw the times of just a couple minutes in some of the customers' environments. So here we have a, uh, the temporary public virtual IP that we can use uh, to verify our um, migration phase. So basically, we have a kilo uh, control plane that is not exposed to our users yet, but we can check if everything is correct. So we log into Horizon, the kilo Horizon, to see if, if uh, everything is there. So as you can see, 
the, the Kilo Horizon. Uh, we have our instance. Everything is fine. User, uh, our uh, users also run some um, API verifications. They will check if their CI is working correctly against their new control plane and so on. So the last step we're going to do here is a switch uh, to a new deployment command, which pretty much does one thing. Well, there are more things, but the most important part is we are switching the original public virtual IP, the one that all the, cost, all the, the users know, um, the one that's configured in every CI and stuff, to, to the new control plane. And that's what happened here. There's no overlapping. The old control plane is stopped. So the public virtual IP is only configured in the, in the new control plane. So what we're doing here is we use the IP, the original IP, the, 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 the right public virtual IP to verify that our, our OpenStack cluster has been upgraded and everything is uh, in kilo version and everything is running correctly. As you can see this, so what we're going to do now is we're just uh, going to create a new instance um, uh, kilo instance uh, using OpenStack kilo version just to, just to make sure everything is fine. And we'll also keep it for the next uh, steps of the, of the demo. Uh, the, the instance has been created. And that's it. We pretty much are done with the upgrade. The last part that left, since we know that everything is fine, we can delete the old control plane, the, the ice house control plane, since we don't need any, it anymore. And we can free some disk space that was occupied by this. And that's it. That's the ice house to kilo upgrade. Now let's do the part two of it, which is, oops, that's actually not ISO to Kilo. This should be Kilo to Mitaka. Sorry for that. But VIO 2.0 to VIO 3.0. That's correct. Uh, so we're going to do the Kilo to Mitaka upgrade now. Um, all the steps are pretty much the same. We're again going to use the instance to track the availability of our control plane. Uh, we're going to connect and run the watch command with, uh, with the uptime command. And we're going to also run the, we'll go also go to OMS to install the new Debian file. Uh, as you can see, we started with version 203 this time. So we did some patching in between. Uh, we didn't include that, but patching is pretty much the same workflow, except we just do it in place. Um, but we start with Kilo version 2015.1.1, which is Kilo version. Uh, so again, VAO patch add, that's the first step. We add a new Debian file uh, to our repository. Uh, we see that the patch is there, but uh, the installed column says it's not installed yet. So we install it. That, again, updates our management server bits. Uh, it updates our plugin. It updates all the Python libraries, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the next thing is to log out, log in, update the, the um, uh, UI plugin. Those steps are pretty much the same. It, so the user knows exactly what, her, what he has to do or what she has to do to upgrade VAO to next version because it hasn't changed since uh, the first release. So here you have version 3.0 and OpenStack 2016.4.7, which is uh, Mitaka. Um, we can also see, so one more thing that we're going to do as a part of this upgrade is we're going to change our architecture, the amount of VMs that we're running. Here we had around 15 VMs. That's the uh, Kilo version. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to run the wizard again and upgrade to Mitaka. So the steps are pretty much the same. We specify new deployment name, this time VAO3. We specify public virtual IP. We don't need private virtual IP anymore. In version 3.0, we just need public virtual IP, and we use private virtual IP from the pre-configured pool of IP addresses. Uh, we finish the wizard. We provision the new control plane, which includes all the new VMs uh, for Mitaka, pre-configured, but, with, but without uh, data yet. So that's the first step um, that, that we're going to do. So it should finish soon. It takes a while. Oh, there you go. It finished. So um, we're going to see that in Mitaka, in VAO 3.0, we have much less VMs. That's the one another thing that we do uh, besides skipping a release. We also change our architecture. We reduce the footprint from 15 VMs to around 7. Uh, so that's another benefit of, of doing an upgrade this way, using blue-green approach. So we again do the migration of data. So what we do here is we migrate the data and um, uh, move the database from Kilo, this time to Mitaka version. Uh, we run uh, uh, migrations, et cetera, et cetera, as a part of, of uh, the step. And we will soon get a Mitaka um, deployment. Whoops, it failed. OK, well, it's recorded, so I cannot kid you much. I knew it's going to happen. So um, uh, what happened is pretty much I actually had a valid error. Uh, I had a misconfiguration in my infrastructure. So the upgrade failed in my lab. 
So I could have just get rid of it and record it again, but instead I decided to show you the feature that Mark mentioned, which is just a rollback. So what we're gonna do here is we, we want to fix it, but we want to restore our cloud for the time of, of when we were gonna fix the issue. So what we do here is we just run a rollback on, on our original control plane, which was Kilo. So we are bringing it back um, in the same uh, data, with the same data that it was. We, can, uh, we, we now verify that it's actually working. We see the horizon again. We see that it's running, it's Kilo version. Um, uh, you can see that it's all good. So users can use their cloud while we are fixing the issue. We delete the, the broken uh, control plane since, since it, it didn't configure correctly. We, we are just gonna restart the process of upgrade once we fix the issue. So we go to fix the issue and we do actual part two, which is the upgrade. And again, it's uh, <laughs> with the wrong data, but via 2.0 to 3.0, but Kilo to Mintaka, not ISOs to Kilo. We did that already. Uh, let's do, go through these steps really quickly because we already did that. It's all the same. We maintain the same process for users so they know they know it. They, they, there is no surprise here. Well, we have exactly the same steps. Again, we run the upgrade. You see the timers again. Uh, again, the first step doesn't incur any downtime, so users can use their cloud as they were using um, without, uh, without any issue. Uh, this step is long, so we, we don't want to uh, incur any downtime on uh, this step. Uh, so we provision new VMs, this time seven VMs, as I mentioned before. Um, all our, our cloud is running correctly. We have Horizon, we have all our APIs accessible, uh, as you can see. And we go back and now we skip, to, I mean, we go to the migrate, migrate data step. That's where we incur the downtime again. So here is actual, the data is uh, um, migrated from, uh, from Kilo to Mitaka. This time there should be no failure, hopefully, no network failure. Well, as I said, it's recorded, so I cannot kid you much. Um, uh, this is gonna succeed. We have a data uh, plane uh, migrated. We have a new public virtual IP again available, so we can verify everything is fine. As I mentioned, our users often run some uh, testing scripts. They run, they check if, if there are no API errors for their workloads, whatever they have right now, um, before they actually expose this to the, to the users. So we can verify it's running. As you can see, the Horizon login page changed because in um, VAO 3.0, we actually expose multiple domains to users. Um, so we can log in and see that the Horizon and basically the Mitaka cloud is up and running. That's the stage where control plane is still in downtime, so we want to make it quick. Um, we're just gonna see that the instances are there. We're gonna see that it's actually Mitaka because Mitaka has this fancy launch instance, a wizard, or maybe it was added in Liberty, I remember. Uh, yeah, it's there. Um, so once we verify that, we're gonna do again the step that we did before, which is switch to the new deployment, and we'll have our public VIP, the original public VIP switch to a new control plane, um, and we'll, have, and we'll expose the new control plane to users. And that's the last step of the upgrade. Once we finish this step, our upgrade is completed. Let's just wait for that. So we can, we can summarize what happened in the demo. Um, and uh, there you go. So what happened here is we upgraded from Icehouse to Mitaka uh, in two steps. Each step we um, skipped the release First time it was Juno, this time it was Liberty. We skipped the releases, and the second time we upgraded, we also changed the architecture of our cloud, so we reduced the foot, VM per footprint uh, from 15 VMs to seven VMs. We also reduced uh, the space required by the VMs. Um, and we swapped out a broken switch, right? Yeah, and <laughs> exactly, and we fixed that without the issue. Uh, we could easily roll back the deployment. Uh, so the last thing that left is just let's delete the old control plane, the Kilo control plane, because we don't need it anymore. We verified that our Mitaka cloud is running. As you can see again, old control plane, 15 VMs, new control plane, 7 VMs. Um, we delete it. And uh, that's pretty much it. Okay, Siddharth? All right, thanks, Carol. Let's go back to our presentation. Yeah.
There you go. All right. So, well, so uh, demos are great, but uh, the million dollar question, uh, is it real? Uh, is it, does it really work for our customers? Uh, well, but the truth is, uh, a lot of our customers, especially for VMware Integrated OpenStack, uh, they have actually gone through the same process that you just saw in the demo in a fast forward way uh, in production. In fact, uh, some of our customers, they were kind of brave enough to actually go through the upgrade process without even telling our support team. So we're like, uh, and after the fact they were done with the upgrade, they're kind of, oh yeah, by the way, we upgraded to your latest release. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Uh, you know, one of the favorite quotes uh, that we from our, one of our SEs, like uh, as you can see, you know, doing an upgrade while just drinking beer and watching a game, like you know, that's how it should be, right? Uh, you know, you're upgrading a production cloud, but not to be worried about uh, what's going to happen uh, around it. Um, so, what's so special with VIO? Uh, what, how do we pull this off? What's the secret sauce? I mean, it really boils down to the overall architecture. What you know, when you run OpenStack on the VMware infrastructure, uh, the basic architecture is something like that. So you have the control plane, um, and you use all the VMware drivers underneath these uh, main projects that are essentially talking to uh, your data plane, which is essentially the VMware uh, you know, software-defined data center. So essentially for vCenter server, uh, NSX, uh, so and so forth. So therefore, which gives us the unique ability that we can actually upgrade the control plane so we can literally swap out in and out uh, from one release to the other, but all your real workloads that are actually running and doing the work, they're never getting affected at all. Uh, you, you never touch them. So guess what? That's, that's what we expect out of it. Um, given that, I mean, there's still things that you want to plan for and some maybe uh, you know, nuances that you have to keep in mind. Uh, well, the simple thing, well, plan for extra resources. You shouldn't have planned for the broken switch, but, uh, but yeah, things like that. You know, make sure that you know, when you're upgrading, uh, you have the relevant uh, infrastructure carved out for that, uh, because that's what you're going to run your next version of the uh, cloud. Next, we, well, we at OpenStack, you know, yeah, we are always improving functionalities, adding new APIs, deprecating the old ones, old ones, and uh, especially when you skip releases, there is a chance that you know an API that existed uh, a release back may not be there anymore. So you got to plan for that. Uh, make sure that you know. Uh, when you're upgrading, you're mindful of that part that, okay, you may not see these APIs. Therefore, uh, for example, for the customers, what does it mean, uh, right? Uh, also, as Mark earlier mentioned, you know, also things about backwards incompatible APIs, like uh, LBAS v1 versus v2. If you have both the clients, well, guess what? You can't work with v2. Um, but ultimately, it's all about you know, preparing your end customers and users that are you consuming your cloud from one version to, to be ready for you know, the change. So for example, uh, as Mark said, like in, in our cloud we run Keystone V2 and V3 both in the latest Mitaka. What does mean? Well, even though if the APIs are backwards compatible, but the clients who have built their automation scripts and whatnot uh, against your cloud, well, they need to be informed ahead in time that, okay, guys, we're gonna switch to a newer version of these APIs. Uh, you have the new capabilities, but you gotta make sure that your uh, client integrations and whatever you have, are capable of consuming those newer versions and are actually talking to the right version of the API to get the new benefit, uh, which is very important. All right? Otherwise, uh, well, they're going to still use the older APIs, older functionality, and they're not going to get the benefit of the newer thing. Uh, with that, I mean, I think that's all what we had. Questions? Yeah, if folks have questions, there's a mic over here. Uh, I think they're yeah. recording us, so come yeah. on up. Um, thank you for the impressive de demo. Um, my question is that uh, you didn't mention when, which step do you update the OpenStack services, like Nova Compute, etc. cetera? So, oh, good. Okay, so we actually don't update them per se because uh, we do not do, up do upgrade in place. We actually set up a new control plane, and this new control plane has all the uh, newer versions of OpenStack uh, components, meaning Nova and Neutron, right? So we already provision them uh, in, let's say we do upgrade from Kilo to Mitaka. We provision them in Mitaka version. And the only thing we do is we reconfigure them uh, in the same way that Kilo was configured, doing well appropriate updates if there is one, and uh, migrate the data, run the database migrations on top of the data, Kilo database. But we do not have to update components per se because we provision them in newer version. So and specifically with Nova Compute, which I think is, is kind of the core of the question there, um, if you think about a traditional KVM architecture, Nova Compute runs per hypervisor, right? In a vSphere architecture, 
uh, a Nova Compute talks to a vSphere cluster. So it's not actually tightly coupled to the, the individual hypervisor host. And that gives us a great deal of flexibility because it's basically just a VM running a process. So we can do that as part of the blue-green upgrade and just reprovision a new, a new VM to, to do that as part of the control right. plane upgrade. And then that's a picture up there that actually summarizes that, I mean, what Mark's saying, right? I yeah. mean, the workloads and everything on the data plane is actually decoupled from the OpenStack control plane uh, in, a, in a way that, that gives us that leverage. Do we have any more questions? Uh, oh. So one question uh, regarding the database migrations. Mm -hmm. Since like uh, some releases, especially Nova, does uh, some migrations uh, not offline, but in online fashion after starting uh, the new service again? And these migrations are usually removed after just one release. So how did you solve that? So uh, essentially, so that's essentially part of the planning. So for example, we said, well, when we do the skip the release, we're actually planning ahead, for example, in this case, from let's say from Ice House to Kilo. So we want to make sure that when we do that, these specific DB migrations uh, that you're talking about, for example, they work for Ice House to Kilo. Yes, I mean, essentially, if you were to directly jump from, say, Ice House to Mitaka, yes, those, you know, the, those uh, disappeared uh, DB schema migrations may not be there, and that may not work. So that's kind of part of the planning when you say, when we're saying, you know, you, you pla if you're planning to uh, you skip a release, be mindful of those things that, well, is there a blind spot there which actually going to hit and actually going to fail? And if that's the case, then that's essentially that kind of like, okay, you cannot skip that particular release if, if that's the case. And it, kind of what that boils down to really is on the vendor side, when we plan out what upgrades we're going to be doing and what our release schedule is going to look like, that's part of the, the risk that we absorb. So you know, the first thing we do is actually try that out, and when something blows up, that's the thing that we got to go fix, right? So on the vendor side, we, we kind of handle that for you. Um, and if you're kind of building your own distribution, uh, or rolling your own open stack, um, that's that's one of those things you have to look out for as well. Sure. Uh, it's just dealing with that. Um, the good news is that uh, even if the migrations themselves disappear after a release, um, Git is your friend. Um, they still exist they're, they're out there somewhere, right? So they're <laughs> right. still out there. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. For the front load balancer, is that a standalone load balancer, or we can use a load balancer as a service? Uh, in our case, it's actually an LB pair. Uh, so we basically spin up two VMs that are running HA proxy and run keep LiveD between them. Yeah. So you, 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 can you use a load balancer as a service? Uh, well, in our case, no, because um, what we're actually spinning up is, is an open stack cloud. Uh, so we don't want to have any dependencies on the management plane itself when we're actually doing those upgrades. Okay, so we do it separately. Do we have? Any more questions? I guess that's it. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thank a lot. you.